So this is a joint colloquium between the Department of Information Studies and the UCLA Library System. Uh, we're, we don't do things together nearly often enough, but we started talking about this, I think about six months ago, saying how are we going to celebrate and acknowledge Open Access Week, which the library has been having events um, all week for. And uh, we have concentrated on open access in my course on scholarly communication and publishing this week. And we've been doing this for several years now. And this is um, how many years of open access week? Five, sixth annual? Yeah, five or six annual uh, years. And it's coordinated around the U.S. and pretty much around the world now. I think this this yeah, week. the second international week. This is the right. second the yeah. second year that it's been in international. So we're not the only ones trying to do these kinds. Yay! These kinds of um, these kinds of events. So ta da! Okay. So notice it says October 18th to 24th everywhere. Okay. Ar around the world. And open access, as uh, those of you have been following this know is uh, really not a U.S. development. The Berlin and Budapest declarations on um, open access go back to 2003, and there have been a number of developments and other declarations in the time since. So before I introduce our speakers, I thought I'd spend just a couple of minutes on uh, giving a broader framing. Because the, the phrase open access has been around for long enough that um, it, it's gotten kind of muddy by now, where it's not clear just quite what we mean by openness, open access. All right, these are from a very well-known book by, uh, by John Walensky, talking about different kinds of open access. Uh, the ones that are most familiar are journals that are published where the author is, um, where the reader is not paying for access. If you think about the economic models of scholarly publishing, usually the library is buying the publications, the author is buying the publications. With open access, generally speaking, we're the situation where the reader has open access to it. Someone is paying for it, uh, but it might be paid for by the author, it might be paid for by foundations, it might be paid for by the university. A lot of open access has to do with shifting around costs from one place to another. So I thought it would be good just to notice that it, the, the definitions have gotten very fuzzy. And it matters for a lot of different reasons. Uh, much of which in our world is about interoperability. We would like to be able to get access not only to publications and to data, we would like to be able to move them uh, between different kinds of formats and connect them to each other in a scholarly environment. We want to be able to use and reuse material in different ways. So these are the people that we've invited, and despite having organized this panel uh, about six months in advance, we unfortunately lost two of our speakers, and we've also lost Greg Lees, our department chair. So it's the two that I've italicized, we've lost and send their regrets. So at the point that we have Libby and Jillian, I'm going to talk about some of the issues of data, which is uh, at the core of what they were both going to talk about. So we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. We have asked each of our distinguished speakers to talk for about five to seven minutes. And uh, that will give us about maybe half the time we have today at most on formal remarks. So please be thinking about all of your questions for everyone. Uh, let me show you the questions that we've asked them to address before I go back and do a bit more introduction to them. Because open access is such a messy term, we thought a nice way to open would be to get everyone to talk about what open access means to them. And you'll notice that we've got people from across the humanities, from the sciences, from the social sciences. We have students, we have faculty, we have staff all trying to uh, reflect on some of these issues. Uh, then they'll spend a couple of minutes each on talking about what they or their groups do to make uh, their work open, and that lets them go back and reflect on the barriers, challenges, and resistance that they're encountering in making work open. So here again is our distinguished panel for today. 
Um, Zoe Abrovsky from the Digital Humanities, we've invited to be our opening speaker, which will give you, and she has a very broad and gorgeous set of slides, which I hope show up in the contrast here as well. Uh, and like I said, I'll talk about some of the data that Libby and Jillian were to talk about. Then we're going to have Andrew Lau, a doctoral student in the Department of Information Studies, but one of the editors of the school-wide journal Interactions. And Stacy Meeker, who's now Publications Director, also has had um, Andrew's role working with Interactions before going and working campus-wide. So we thought it was very important to get students to speak on this and to talk about how you actually edit and make an open access journal available. So Andrew and Stacy will cover those. And then we'll come back to Bonnie, who is, as you can see, the Digital Collection Services Librarian for the library. And uh, Bonnie is also the point person for UCLA for the UC eScholarship program. So we have uh, repositories of a number of UCLA programs. In fact, uh, one that I will talk about is the Center for Embedded Network Sensing. We have built what is currently the second largest repository in the UC-wide uh, scholarship, and Jillian has taken the lead on that, and several others of our students uh, for that part as well. Okay. So that was a very quick introduction, and enough, I hope, to prime us a rich set of questions from all of you. So with that, um, Zoe, would you like to talk from your beautiful slide? I'm Zoe Borowski. I work at the Center for Digital Humanities, Academic Technology Services. I have an adjunct appointment in the Scandinavian department, but I'm talking about the Encyclopedia of Egyptology, one of the projects that we've had here at UCLA for the last four years. Um, the first question, what does open access mean in your work? My answer is that open access is the ideal for us. It means providing any reader free online access to high quality, peer reviewed encyclopedia articles by top notch Egyptologists. So the Encyclopedia of Egyptology was designed as an entryway to scholarship in the field and it was, we had both specialists and novices in mind as readers, but sustaining open ask access meant for us confronting the reality and those, that reality was just the publishing costs of producing and maintaining an online scholarly journal. In order to control those costs, I'm going to show you a little bit about the kinds of partnerships that we developed here at UCLA, mostly with the digital library team, to, com to create a hybrid model for this journal, an open and a subscription version to the Encyclopedia of Egyptology. So the second question, what do you or your group do to make your work open? This is our hybrid model. We pursued NEH funding for four years of support to develop a pilot of this encyclopedia. We commissioned the articles, we developed prototypes, we hired copy editors, programmers, designers, and librarians to help us produce it. But the reality of making UEE sustainable be beyond this four years of initial funding meant that UEE decided to use this hybrid model. We have a free version, and that's available through CDL's eScholarship, and a full version that's a subscription-based website with more features and services for the users. The next slides show how we use the existing infrastructure and services to control our costs. Some of you may be familiar with this interface. This is eScholarship's um, peer review, online peer review system. One of the ways that we decided to control our costs was to use the free services that are available here at UCLA. eScholarship has this great online peer review system, and that's what we decided to use. The result is that we can produce PDF versions of the articles, and these are available online for free on CDL's eScholarship. <coughs> what this means is that these articles can will turn up on searches that users do in Google. They can read and search the articles online, and they can download the PDFs. This is the view of our beautiful subscription version. <laughs> Part of the challenge was to define those features and services that users would be willing to pay subscriptions for, or libraries would be willing to subscribe to. Um, in order to cr create this subscription version, we, lit we worked with the Digital Library Program, we worked with Academic Technology Services here at UCLA, 
the Center for Digital Humanities helped us with design, and we developed this pilot that now has about, I think, 35 articles in there. The slide shows some of the features that we developed at ATS for the full subscription version. This slide shows over on the right the annotation or the uh, glossary feature for the novice users. We developed time maps and a little mini map that appears in an article that shows each place that's mentioned in that article. And we, an we developed an annotation feature so that users could enter annotations for the article and save them, retrieve them when they return in a feature that we call My UEE. This slide shows just a real simple workflow that we put together for the two different versions. It starts out an article starts out in the open version and becomes encoded, uploaded to the digital library system, and then it's turned into the full version. It shows the goals, one of the goals for the project, we use this workflow to show or to think up ways that we might integrate grad students from the Near Eastern Languages and Cultures project into our workflow. We use their knowledge of Egyptology, but we train them to help with encoding and creating metadata, another way of controlling costs, graduate student labor. <laughs> <laughs> the next slides show how we use the existing infrastructure, staff and technology here at UCLA to help produce the full version. And I'll talk a little bit about UCLA's digital library collection system. I feel like I should have Lisa McCauley right here with me. Uh, she was really integral in developing this and academic technology services. This, is, this slide is an example of the existing infrastructure at UCLA. We used the digital library collection system to upload the XML encoded versions of the article. Grad students attach metadata using their domain knowledge and the digital library system helps control the metadata. Um, and, and the grad students are trained in this process. <coughs> Those of you who are familiar with XML might recognize the Oxygen interface and application here. And the slide shows students being trained in XML markup of an article. We tag place names, glossary items, and bibliography. And we made use of the standard that the digital library program has uh, set on the TEI standard, Lisa McCauley did a great job customizing the schema and training, helping to train the grad students in TEI markup. And this shows them working at the ATS sandbox where we just happen to have licenses for oxygen and um, dedicated workstations that the students can use. So Lisa comes to ATS to help train the grad students. But in order to control the vocabulary that's used in markup, we went to ATS developers and said, this encyclopedia is gonna have a bazillion different place names <laughs> over a span of, I don't know how many years, the places changed names. And so to control the vocabulary used in markup, the ATS developers uh, created an administrative interface that the grad students use. They log in, they can control the metadata here. It gets used when they're marking up articles. So the last question, what barriers, challenges, and resistance do you encounter in making your work open? I think if, if you look over this slide and you see all the people that are involved, you can imagine that there's a high cost. The one that surprised us was copy editing. Um, and here we, we hired a professional copy editor. We realized that the work of many of our highly qualified specialists who were writing these articles do not normally publish in English, and we really needed a professional editor. Um, other challenges, the role of the publisher for UEE subscription version, the full version that we host here, it doesn't fall neatly on any one UC or UCLA entity. Partnership between the ATS, between ATS, CDH, and Digital Library Program evolved to kind of fill that gap, but we don't really have the type of services that a press would have. There's no cost recovery pricing for copyright permission or images and licenses to applications such as Google Maps. Because UEE needs to recover its costs, it's treated as a for-profit entity. So we would actually, the irony was, we would actually save money, a good deal of money, if we were completely open. 
We'd get the Google Map license for free. Uh, we'd get a discount on licensing images. We've had to resort to just using images that the authors can provide to us. And we would even um, save on the cost of developing an application to manage subscriptions. We're looking to presses in order to help us to do that. So our end result, we have applied for a third round of funding from NEH to help work, us, work out the issues with the current business model and explore partnerships with other presses. One possibility is to close the full version while we build an endowment to, uh, fully, to make it all fully accessible. But the, the business model is still sort of up for grabs and, and being negotiated. Thank you, Zoe. You see why we put her up first, because this was just this was a wonderful broad sweep of a very successful, very rich project, and, and you, you've wrestled with not only the technical problems, but some of the economic problems. And th so that's a good frame for us to start with, and I'm sure those, those will echo back as we, um, as we work through some of these issues. Um, as I noted, I said I would say a few things about data, some of the things that um, Jillian and um, Libby were planning to cover if they've been able to be here today. So I just made one quick slide and, and one diagram to go with it um, thereafter. So a, a bit of background is, uh, as I mentioned, SENS, the Center for Embedded Network Sensing, is a large five university uh, science and Technology Center funded by the National Science Foundation based at UCLA. We're in our eighth year of ten years of funding. And one of the things that the National Science Foundation wants is to see what the scholarly products are of the center. You know, there's $40 million worth of base funding, and the obvious products are, are very much the publications, but also the data for them as well. So what we have been studying as a, a group, our data practices team, is this whole life cycle of work that comes out of the center, looking at the publications, looking at the data, looking at how people go out in the field, and um, Jillian, um, Alberto Pepe, uh, Matt Mayernick, and other students have been out in the field really studying this whole set of processes. And then what we like to do is tie them back together again technically so that we can capture the publications and we're doing so by putting them into the UC scholarship with the help of Bonnie and others. Uh, then we're trying to capture some of their data and pr provide discovery services. Uh, Matt particularly has been working on the context and field work and layering those, and then we're using a technology called object reuse and exchange to try to bring all of those together from these different environments. So open access to us means uh, curating the data as well as the publications, not as an end in itself, but as a means to promote knowledge discovery and use and reuse. The data sharing and, and access to them and access to the publications are very fundamental to our work. So what do we do to make our work open? We deposit them. We've been much more successful at getting people to deposit publications because NSF requires a bibliography with every quarterly and annual report than we have with the data, although they have now begun to ask us to deposit uh, the data and for new grants going forward, a two-page data management plan is going to be required of all new applicants to NSF. So that, that reinforces uh, what's going forward. Libby has been running the social science data archives at UCLA for over 30 years now since she got her master's degree with us and they collect, curate, and provide access to social science data, largely uh, big social surveys, and then they work in consortial relationships with the other major centers around the U.S. and around the world, like the ones at University of Michigan and, uh, and Berkeley and elsewhere. What barriers, challenges, and resistance do we encounter? Uh, these are many. Like I said on the uh, the data are much harder to get. We were very surprised in this last round of annual reports where we had, um, I think, something like 30 individual project reports that went in for the year of the center. And we knew from studying these that there were multiple data sets associated with each one of them. And yet only something like seven 
of the data sets were actually deposited to go along with them. So Jillian and Matt have been looking into why, and it's, it's really a, a fascinating uh, soci socio-technical set of issues. For example, who really is the author of the data set? Who's in charge? Is it the uh, principal investigator who should be putting them in? Is it the graduate student? Is it the dissertation? Is it some administrator? Everybody thinks somebody else took care of it, and it's not even that clear what, uh, what aspect of the project are the data and which ones which ones are kept. We've been looking more broadly at the incentives and disincentives to share, which vary quite a bit from one field to the next. It's much more work to make your data available for other people. You've got to do the metadata, the kinds of things that you're putting massive and very expensive expertise into, even at graduate student rates. This is still very highly intellectual work that you are investing in it. And it's one thing for people to do a spreadsheet for their own use, it's quite something else for them to mark it up to metadata standards. People get rewarded for publications. They don't get rewarded so much for good metadata or for deposit, although that's varying between uh, fields. The intellectual property, who actually owns it when you've got multiple cooperating institutions, the, is, it, is the PI at UCLA and the data is at USC or is it Caltech? Did this come out of a sensor network that's in Peru or one we have in Mexico? Are there cross-border data issues? It gets very messy very quickly. Uh, the technology barriers, including things like being able to implement object reuse and exchange, uh, the UCE scholarship, even though it does implement the, the common standards around the Open Archives Initiative, the protocol for metadata harvesting. It's a long way from being a really open platform that's ready to layer object reuse and exchange on it. And it's not really an open platform either. So even though the purpose of it is open access to content, we're not finding that it's a very open technology to do the kind of rich scholarly inter interchange that we envision. So there's a, a number of different things going on here that I'd be more than happy to talk about uh, when we get to the, the general discussion. Yeah. So that was a very quick tour. So now we are going to hear from Andrew who is a doctoral student in information studies, known to many of you, and working as a graduate research assistant on interactions that you will talk about. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so I'm one of three editors for interactions. Um, we're an online open access peer review journal uh, edited by students from the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies here at UCLA. Uh, we seek to bring together senior and emerging scholars, activists, and professionals representing a range of theory and practice from a variety of disciplinary backgrounds. Uh, we view education and information to be areas of inquiry where diverse interests and epistemologies converge, and we aim to publish manuscripts employing critical frameworks to link research with larger social and political contexts and current debates. Uh, for interactions, the term open access reflects how we conduct our work, our work with the journal. It coincides with a specific part of our mission which is to provide a scholarly platform uh, for critical discussions around issues relating to social justice. In this sense, open access is both an ethical commitment as well as an operative means by which to actualize this orientation. We view engagement to include scholars and students from other disciplines, as well as those outside of academia. For interactions, we believe that it is unethical for knowledge to be cordoned off because of the high costs associated with traditional forms of academic publishing. Closing off access for certain groups because they can't pay for subscriptions ultimately limits the potential for the democratization of knowledge. In addition to open access for our readers, we encourage those from outside the academy to submit their manuscripts for publication. Open access is more than just viewing our journal as a mode of dissemination, but to also see it as a platform to encourage entry and access to the channels of dialogue for a broad community of contributors. By encouraging activists and professionals to submit their manuscripts to, man to interactions, our hope is to provide a forum for critical, for critical and socially engaged research that challenges the idea that expertise and knowledge resides solely in the university and academic publishing outlets. Uh, since open access is built into the eScholarship platform, uh, most of what we do in support of this directive has to do with the promotion of interactions itself. 
when we circulate our calls for papers or other information to support the visibility of interactions. We try to also communicate that our journal is open access with the hopes of clearly establishing our politics that deprioritizes the commercial aspects of scholarly publishing. I think it would be fair to say that although open access initiatives have been adopted at the level of the repository, Interaction's investment in openness is expressed in how we attempt to re redeploy the idea as something that is inherently political, and that, and that is how we re rhetorically align the journal with a non-commercial stance. In encouraging submissions from outside the academy, we oftentimes work closely one-on-one -on -one with these authors to bring their submissions to the standards of academic publishing. In other words, we don't just shut them down because the submission doesn't conform to the conventions of academic manuscripts. As part of our open access mission, and as long as we believe the content is worth disseminating, we will try to put in the time and effort to work with the authors to ensure that their voices aren't silenced just because they don't have prior experience in academic publishing. We view our roles to be that of facilitation and rather than gatekeeping, of encouraging dialogue rather than filtering it. Although we view the amount of attention that we give to working closely with authors to be characteristic of how we run the journal, it's also a challenge, and frankly speaking, all three of us on the editorial team are students trying to move through our programs in a timely manner. <laughs> Consequently, the value that we place in working with authors who have little or no prior experience in publishing is also shadowed by the fact that we have practical considerations of being, of being students ourselves, balancing our own individual commitments. Another challenge that we face would be an academic culture that generally privileges publication in top-ranked journals that have long histories of publication, many of which are not open access. This means that individual authors might question whether or not it's worthwhile for their tenure files to publish with Interactions or any other open access journal when they could ostensibly publish their manuscripts in more established journals. We try to mitigate this to a certain degree by allowing authors to retain copyright for their pub publications so that if they decide that they want to publish their papers elsewhere, they can do so provided they also understand that they should acknowledge interactions as the original publisher. But whatever our attempts to boost the visibility of the journal, whether in the forms of appeals to economic, intellectual, or socio-political benefits of open access publishing, this challenge extends beyond interactions itself. It requires that the broader scholarly community interrogate what open access means for the good of the academy as well as the public. Thank you. So I think Andrew has done a very good job of showing that there, there's a real political and ethical and moral dimension as well as an economic dimension. And having students be as self-reflective as, as you've already seen about what it means to participate in this process I think is really essential as, as we look at open access not just as one about an alternative form of publishing but something that really goes very deep in, into what we think scholarly communication is. Um, Stacy Meeker, who had, as I said, had um, Andrew's role before and now is uh, the publications director for all of the graduate student journals at UCLA, um, will speak from that perspective. My name is Stacy Meeker, and I'm very happy to be here as the director of publications for the UCLA Graduate Students Association. Uh, I'm entering my third year in this position. Prior to that, I spent two years with Interactions, and during a much earlier stint as a graduate student, I was the editor of the print journal Parole Gelée in the French department. I've also been involved for some years with uh, another open access journal on campus, Anthropoetics. And of course, I took Professor Borgman's classes as well as other classes here in, uh, in IS. Uh, as to address the question of what open access means to us in our work, a little bit of context is in order. The UCLA Graduate Students Association is an unusually large and active student government. Uh, it has run for years an even more unusual publications program uh, that funds and provides support to roughly 30 different graduate student run journals uh, using specially allocated portions of graduate student fees. Several of these journals have long and distinguished records. Mestair, for example, is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year as it also goes online as an open access journal. Of these, roughly half are open access publications and there are several more that are likely to join the number this next year. Uh, the goals of this program have been to provide graduate students with apprenticeships in scholarly publishing, additional opportunities to publish their own research, intellectual freedom, and the opportunity to share the results of their editorial work and scholarship produced. 
Open access for us comes in a variety of flavors, but given that we are supported by precious student fees, whenever and wherever possible and appropriate, we try to make the results of this collective investment as freely available as possible to as many readers as possible, both here at the university and beyond. Um, I've worked with two different GSA administrations who are diametrically opposed in almost all things, except for their commitment to open access. And this support for open access among students appears to be growing. Uh, I've brought a handout which I, I put on the table there uh, about a right to research uh, document uh, resolution that was promulgated recently by a new group of uh, national consortium of graduate students. Uh, and. Uh, you can see that this movement is gaining uh, momentum, at least among students, among graduate students who support it. Um, during my tenure with GSA, uh, seven of our formerly print-only journals moved online to UC eScholarship open access platform. Uh, we worked with the library where we were first able to persuade some of our oldest journals to have all of their back issues digitized and then housed by the Internet Archive through a partnership between the archive and the library. Journals were then encouraged to take the step of moving their operations online to e-scholarship. I think this is very important to address the, address the topic of this entire workshop was what new librarians need to know. And part of our very important uh, work that we've been trying to do would not have ever been possible without our very, very, very close association with, with the library. And that's a bit of what I'm describing here. Of our 11 or so e-scholarship journals, and we constitute over 25% of all e-scholarship journals, most are online only. One still operates with an embargo, but is technically open access. And several are experimenting with a mixed or hybrid delivery, uh, offering free digital download of PDFs, uh, like the Encyclopedia of Egyptology, with an option to purchase a print-on-demand uh, issue copy through UC Press. And we've worked closely with UC Press to try to make this happen. Workflow is an issue, but we're working on it. Um, we have other journals, like Interactions and Mediascape, that were born digital. And some, like the Pacific Review of Ethnomusicology, that moved to online delivery on their own after many years of being in print. In print. They felt that this was an important commitment to make, and they, and they managed to do so on their own. How do we make our work open? We provide important funding, since open access isn't free, but we also coordinate support with the library and make centralized and and centralized resources available to our editors. Our first task is often to inform the graduate student editors of the variety of options possible, because frequently they're mired in a, in a, a world in which they simply print their journal and, and move on, and information is, is key. Although publishing in general still has a basic set of best practices associated with it, the digital era has introduced new and rapidly changing areas of expertise that all graduate student editors cannot be expected to master and track. Our relationship with the UCLA library is thus absolutely essential in bridging this information gap. The Internet Archive Digitization Project was in many respects key to providing momentum to the move online for several journals of long standing, but this tremendous cost savings in hard dollars was the result of a lot of hard work on the part of the library, GSA, and journal editors, and considerable stress as the window to have this expensive work done for free was closing. For the past two years, we've hosted a twice-monthly series with Bonnie uh, Tiarina and Angela Riggio called Luncheon Librarians, in which journal editors are free to come to consult with our experts informally. It's been well enough institutionalized now that editors pop in, even when Bonnie and Angela aren't there, and say, where are the librarians? Uh, our division also provides journals with material, material resources and office space in which to meet and work, the advanced software required for online and print publishing, staff familiar with the equipment and software and so forth. In our experience, it often takes a village to make open access work. There's a great deal to know and there can be many moving institutional parts. For example, on the more mundane side, GSA provides accounting services to the journals and the accounting department has to interact with independent vendors as well as institutions like UC Press, all of whom have different systems in place. On the other end of the spectrum, journals may need help in deciding whether they can really post a video and have to call on the librarians. Harnessing the distributed knowledge and the collective influence of all members of the extended system is crucial to making open access choice a viable one. One of the biggest challenges we face is the perception that open access and all things internet are necessarily free. We recently faced a major challenge to our own funding because the Center for Student Programming noticed that a number of our journals had gone online and concluded that this meant that we would need less money. We've been battling this challenge, uh, <laughs> and if any, I'm behind, that's why. Uh, 
Fortunately, this GSA administration saw the value of our program and decided to set a positive, positive precedent, but this is a call to vigilance. Beyond the need to make the case for funding opens access, there is the question of the delicate balance of trust required to make the system work. Whether journal opts to go it alone and cope with the rapidly multiplying professional components over which it needs mastery, or moves to a platform such as eScholarship or an instance of DSpace, these choices have consequences. A print journal can change printers or typesetters at will, but moving a large digital corpus and maintaining its scholarly integrity and interoperability is a difficult thing to do. There's no substitute for sound infrastructures, including good policies, as Professor Borgman's latest book demonstrates. But we're often faced with ch changes that outstrip planning as money grows tighter, personal change, or technology. That's lovely, isn't it? Um, <laughs> takes a new direction and watchful cooperation among publishers and librarians as these socio-technical systems unfold is crucial. New librarians can always learn the principles of open access, but our example shows that each day on the job is indeed a learning experience. Thank you. Stacy, that was, that was wonderful. I, and, and this is yet another dimension. I mean, not only have you seen the student commitment and the breadth, uh, but the, the naivete around the funding of what it really takes to do publishing. It knows no bounds of faculty and students alike. So it's, it's really key that we have you know, people in your position who are informed about this set of issues. Uh, but I think it also notes the important convergence. And libraries are becoming more and more publishers. This is something that really has taken a, a, a flip over a century's period when libraries were much more publishers and are, are coming back full circle. And this kind of partnership around open access is, is really striking. And I think you gave us excellent examples of that as well. Um, Bonnie has kindly agreed to be our wrap up here and she keeps taking notes. I, we know <laughs> any of us could talk for an hour or more on these topics and we're, we're trying not to because we want to hear from all of you. So Bonnie, please. Okay. I'm glad to go last because uh, a lot of the other speakers have kind of done the presentation for me. Um, uh, so I'm going to kind of take a slightly different approach. Obviously I'm a librarian. I'm the Digital Collection Services Librarian at YRL. Um, and I'm approaching this from the point of view of a practicing librarian. As someone who uh, has scholarly communication outreach as part of my job duty. Um, those of you considering working in any academic library have probably seen job postings like scholarly communication librarian or um, sort of hybrid positions like science and scholarly communication librarian or even our recent post at UCLA Library for a librarian for digital research and scholarship. So this is a growing trend. Um, and it's, it's growing in importance within libraries, and libraries are definitely seeing their increasing role in this area. Um, so since scholarly communication outreach is part of my job here at UCLA, and um, it was an area I've worked in in my in previous positions um, as a professional librarian, um, that's how I'm going to approach these three questions. So for me personally, open access is right in line with librarians' jobs of providing as much access as possible to content that our users want and need. It makes sense then that libraries take on the role of supporting open access and public access initiatives locally, nationally, and internationally when possible. So I'm going to show you uh, a few examples of how libraries are supporting more openness to materials um, on these levels and give you a few examples of what we've done here at UCLA. Um, I have a lot more examples to share, so I'd be happy to talk to any future academic librarians um, who are interested in hearing more about um, what I do and, and some of the specific examples that, that um, we're working on here at UCLA. Um, I also want to throw in the definition of scholarly communication into the mix um, as well because I see a work about open access um, as falling under that broad area. Scholarly communication is used to describe obviously the process of scholars communicating with each other um, and by that I mean sharing and publishing their research findings um, that, that are available to a wider, and making them available to a wider community of interested people. Um, so open access doesn't, doesn't just mean, at least to me, um, sort of capital O, capital A open access. It means um, allowing for more free-flowing scholarly communication, um, not restricted or not as restricted by subscription publications. I say not as restricted, restricted because there is still a value in some cases in what publishers um, do and there's also a lot that can be communicated between scholars um, without the use of traditional publishers. Um, so um, what, what do you do to make work 
uh, open. So within my job as a librarian, what I do to make work open, um, several things that I'm going to briefly cover. So uh, several people have mentioned e-scholarship. Um, we have uh, we are part of the 10 campuses that, that use the e-scholarship system. If there's a need on campus for a place to put up scholars' postprints, um, departments' working papers or conference proceedings, or if a scholar is looking for an alternative location to publish and preserve their scholarly material, I promote e-scholarship as a possible solution, which is free to the user and supported by the UCLA library. E-scholarship can also host open access journals, as several folks have mentioned. Um, so that's, that's an area where we, um, we work to support open access journals on campus. Um, we also encourage and support open access publishing. We have a librarian, uh, Marta Brunner, who is on the steering committee for Open Humanities Press, a new type of uh, press. It calls itself an open access collective in critical and cultural theory. Um, we also um, support open access by uh, being members of uh, groups such as Biomed Central, uh, which is a publisher that um, uh, provides open access journals, and that's an author fee uh, open access publication. And um, as being members, we provide discounts or offer discounts uh, for those article processing fees. So these are kind of various ways that the library supports that. We also, uh, we have a team, a scholarly communication steering team that uh, provides workshops, uh, class lectures, um, videos like this video being recorded right now um, on issues like copyright, author rights, uh, fair use, and creative commons. Um, the way we see it is if you know your rights, you're more likely to know how to retain the ones you want. Um, when you're signing your copyrights, even if it is to more traditional publishers, um, knowing the rights that you want to retain, knowing how you want to use your work is another way to make content more open and more accessible. Um, fair use is important to teach so that people know what they, they are allowed to use. Um, and, and also for those who are creating new works, um, expanding access to their work by using Creative Commons or other types of licenses to, um, to make sure their work is accessible as they're comfortable with. And then we do things like, uh, like this week, hoping, uh, hosting Open Access Week to just bring more information about um, open access to the campus. In addition, we, um, we support complying with um, public access mandates like the National Institutes of Health, and we uh, lobby in Congress for government funded, other government funded um, research to be made publicly available. So uh, we're, we actively um, on campus uh, get folks to uh, support and write letters in, um, in support of that. So um, the barriers I see in my work, I sort of have some, some daily barriers, but I think time is going to fix those. But they might be things that you would um, encounter, at least for the, the, the short term. Um, barriers such as faculty concern about tenure, if their projects um, will be considered the same way as was mentioned. Uh, graduate students concerned with how their departments may perceive their work, if it's digital work. Um, in general, there's some misinformation out there about open access being equated with a lack of peer review. Um, that's that's a sort of a myth that some publishers are perpetuating, but again, I just think over time that, that sort of stuff um, will fade away, especially as we, as we have more good, high-quality examples of open access. Um, and also within, uh, within libraries, I think it's, it's an area that um, could be daunting for, um, for new librarians or librarians who haven't worked in this area. So it is, um, uh, that can be an issue in, in just um, uh, within a library getting the kind of interest to promote these areas. I sort of see those as barriers that, um, that I experience. And then a couple big barriers I think have all been mentioned. Um, I was going to say technology, money, and centralized management. Um, and I can give you examples of those, but I will stop there since my time's So let, uh, let the discussion begin. Uh, please ask questions and we will pass them along. Okay, I, I don't know how much of that will have made it into the recording, and, and it's, it's way beyond what I can possibly summarize. But how about if I just, um, for briefly, say we really want to be more explicit about the, the true cost of infrastructure, that, that publishing is has never been uh, cheap, and as, as you know far better than the rest of us, 
uh, scholarly publishing was always considered a, a gentleman's profession at which one uh, spent a lot of money and did not necessarily make a lot of money back. So try to do open access. We, we have to, we're shifting costs around. So we're going to ask each of our speakers to talk about infrastructure and costs a little bit. Do I get to start? You do. We'll <coughs> just move along. Um, well, I didn't bring my balance sheet <laughs> with me, so I can't really give you amounts. Um, I guess I could talk about what NEH has funded. That's been our basic source of income over the last four years. And those were two grants, each were, um, each were about $300,000. And I mean, a lot of that money went to um, fund author contributions. They each got, I think, like $40 for an article. Um, but it ended up that that wasn't a real incentive to them, the amount of work that they were putting into it. Um, as I mentioned, we, we saved, I think we saved some money by hiring graduate students to do the, training the graduate students to do a lot of the, the markup costs. But I think the thing that did surprise us was and I, and I believe I mentioned it was just copy editing costs and, and the need for at least two editors working almost full time to just negotiate with, you know, almost rewrite some of the articles that, you know, these are native speakers in French and they publish in French and suddenly we told them they had to write their article, you know, highly specialized knowledge, you know, in English. and without an editor who's really familiar with the field, um, it was, you know, we just needed that, that professional quality in order to have it pass academic muster. And I think that to us was the most surprising. I mean, everything else we had pretty much planned on um, as costs that we could manage. And, and that was the one thing that, you know, kept hitting us and that we were, in a sense, the PDFs that we were putting on eScholarship were the most expensive thing that that we were producing because it was the cost of edit, you know, editing and making it, you know, readable English and you know, high quality scholarship. And I think that was the irony of it was, you know, here we are giving this for free, and and that is the most expensive piece that we have. There there are of course development costs for the the full subscription model. And the thing there that surprised us was that we couldn't, that we would have to, in order to manage the subscription, you know, sort of, there wasn't any software at UCLA that was already doing that, you know, managing subscription and handling things like marketing. And we've had, you know, partnerships with UC Press trying to work these things out. And it's been a lot of meetings and a lot of time trying to iron out all those difficulties. So. No budgets, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that question is really the crux of of a lot of the the issues with open access. I mean, it really is. If you have the scholars, the same scholars that would be publishing their work through a traditional publisher, now uh, wanting to do that that same work with the same level of peer review, the same intellectual uh, um, work, but they want to do it outside of that publishing um, sphere, it's, it's the infrastructure and the money. That's the only part. And so, you know, a long time ago, um, eight or ten years ago, one solution that, that the UCs thought of was e-scholarship. Here, here was a way for the library to, we do pay and we do support that. Um, it's not, it's definitely not, um, you know, the, the solution for every situation, but the idea was if all that they need is a technological infrastructure or a free or, or inexpensive platform, then uh, if that's the, the way that we could support, then that, you know, we, we would want to do that. So, um, you know, I think uh, within libraries, it's, it's figuring out um, um, how, whether it's e-scholarship or other tools we have. Um, Zoe works a lot with the, the digital library program in the library. Um, you know, how can we use the tools that we have to support um, scholarship and to support um, preservation and um, sort of future access of it? And that's, it's just becoming, um, I think, part, part of our necessary budget. It's not like a, a side thing. It has to be a, 
um, you know, front and center thing. And I think positions like the one we're, we're creating um, help kind of push that along. So in some ways, the library is trying to, to help with, uh, with some of those infrastructure costs. Um, as far as the uh, hosting questions go, uh, we have e-scholarship journals, but we have journals that have operated independently of e-scholarship, often by choice, uh, because of the uh, delivery problems with uh, e-scholarship in terms of its being able to delivery, deliver uh, 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 streaming media and that sort of thing. Also, there's an issue of independence from e-scholarship. Uh, you know, it has many good things uh, that. Uh, to say to to recommend it, but there are concerns uh, for those of us who've worked with it closely. Um, I I have some hesitations myself. My po own position about that is that we all have to work together to make sure that it works right uh, and and uh, uh, promote that. But in addition to that, we also have the costs that uh, some journals have of being hosted by their own departments. Their own servers and their own departments will host them. Uh, but they have to see to the question of data archiving. We've been working with the library about trying to come up with schemes for making sure that the content of our digital journals is archived for those who are not operating with e-scholarship. Uh, but then again, there's a cost associated with this, and it's going to be a growing cost. Uh, and it's very difficult to figure out exactly what that's going to be. Uh, in addressing what Zoe uh, brought up about the question of copy editing, copy editing will never go away. Uh, and those journals who have tried to skimp on copy editing have found themselves uh, in, in a, a very unhappy state. Um, and so we continually have to have to pay for copy editing. Um, for those journals of ours who are opting for a hybrid solution of the um, uh, print on demand through UC Press, you can go to Amazon and Google one of our journals and you'll, you'll find it there, but it has to be laid out. And not everyone has the expertise to do that. It's not sufficient to do it in Word and have your notes have a line uh, uh, stretching across the page. And this, but this is also a, the case for, for e-scholarship articles. Some of them need to be, if you have a more complicated e-scholarship article, it needs someone to lay it, out, lay it out properly. So that's also an expense. So we have preservation expenses. We have hosting expenses. We have copy editing expenses. We have the expense also of trying to figure out what best practices are in this changing environment. And we have nothing in place uh, formally for trying to deal with the question of markup. And we're, we're trying to work through that, but we don't have anything in place for that. So. But interactions, we're, I guess we're quite fortunate because we don't have to deal with a lot of these issues ourselves. Um, our primary costs are associated with the actual operations of the journal itself. And we have the support of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies to provide us with money as well as GSA. And Stacy is you know, instrumental in, in making sure that we, we are able to operate. Um, we, do, we do pay for our own copy editor uh, who isn't affiliated with UCLA. So that's one of the costs that we have to factor into our own uh, yearly budgets. Um, but otherwise, most of the work that we do, uh, not just the editorial team, um, but anyone who's associated with, with bringing uh, the two issues of interactions every year. It's primarily volunteer, and we actually have one of our book review editors in uh, the audience, Delena, um, and she volunteers uh, in helping to, to make sure every issue comes out when it should be. Thanks, and, and, just, and just briefly on interaction. So there's three student editors to, for a total of about, what, 50 hours a week of paid time Plus, you know, plus tuition, and then these other ancillary costs. So considerable, and that's for a journal that produces four issues per year. Uh, two issues per year. Two issues, two, sorry, two issues per year. Okay, so there's, I mean, these are really very considerable investments to, to put these out. Uh, just briefly on SENS, which is physically housed over in Bolter Hall School of Engineering uh, of, as the headquarters out of five universities, <coughs> W there's absolutely no funding in the NSF budget to do this at all. And we have been putting it together out of nibbling around the edges of, of my grants because only because it fits into our data practices research, is we're using it as, as a test bed to look at these other intellectual issues. We've gotten sense to carve out uh, 10 hours a week of student time here and there for maybe three or four quarters total in this whole period. 
Uh, but we've just we've, we've said we've contributed all we can possibly contribute. My students have got to write their dissertations, um, which is which is more important at this stage. And, and we've we've done some proof of concept, and we're looking for a little bit of other startup money. Well, start up or wind down because SENS is now going into its last two years of funding of, of a 10-year cycle, and NSF does not know how to wind down a major project. NSF does not understand infrastructure in that way. So we think this is an absolutely crucial time for the university to understand what does it take to wind down the intellectual legacy of a very, very successful 10-year venture involving not just five universities but many other partners and currently 300 members associated uh, associated with SENS. So we think this is going to be an important test case and we're we're looking for some funds to sort of do that wind down because we think there's a lot of proof of concept for UCLA to to, uh, to learn lessons from. Um, we've got a couple of good papers out of this as well. So that, that's the, pay, the payoff more than the, the funding. Okay. We promise to give shorter answers to some of your questions um, and you can direct them to anyone individually as well. Other questions? So the, the question is to ask the panelists to reflect on uh, well, th that's one particular open access model the Interactions has of non-exclusive uh, non -exclusive deposit. Uh, so, I mean, that's one model. Um, a more common model is to use Creative Commons licenses, where the, uh, the author uh, or the journal continues to hold copyright but lease, lease or licenses it for, uh, for open access. There's a number. And then you've got even journals that are not open access but will allow authors to publish a preprint or postprint version in a repository. So much of what of the SENS publications is published elsewhere in journals that are not open access, but we're using the the rights to deposit that go along with the publication agreements of for profit journals. So that there's many models. Who wants to comment? So in, in my time as uh, Interactions Editor, I'm starting my second year, and we have two-year appointments. There's only been one person who's actually told us that they were going to republish an article that they published with us. And it was someone who, was, who wanted to publish in an edited volume. Um, so I don't really know how common it is. Um, sometimes they, maybe they just don't tell us. Um, but for us, our priority is to make sure that the, the article is out there. And if they want to republish it, they can. Um, everyone has to sign a, an author agreement that you know, stipulates that if they want to, to republish uh, in somewhere else, they can do so. Um, but, but they probably have to link or point Right, they have to, they have to acknowledge to interaction. Source, right. right. I think in general, though, that um, most scholarly open access journals um, would treat the, the idea of only publishing an article once in one place as, as uh, the more standard thing, I think, as, as you sort of stated. I think that that's, that's more typical. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Other questions? Uh, Danielle, and then here. So the, the question is about differences between, uh, between disciplines and experience, and particularly in faculty attitudes around open access. We'll give it to Stacy first, anyway. My evidence is anecdotal, but uh, word has it that, um, in, at least in the humanities departments we've worked with, that the faculty are watching and they're interested. Uh, I've heard of one faculty member who you know, vehemently opposed one journal going online, but this person has very traditional ideas of scholarship. But in general, there's been a great deal of supportiveness, but standing back and wanting to see uh, in the humanities. Ironically, uh, some of the places where we have seen reluctance to move uh, to open access is in um, more art-oriented uh, programs. Like, uh, for example, we have an animation journal, and there's a great deal of concern about moving the animation material online, uh, obviously because of the, the, the creativity of the, of the artists, because there's some wonderful material. We have the only animation journal in the country, but there's a concern about moving it there. So it's, we're, but we don't have many science journals of any kind. So. Oh, I'll repeat it. Yes, the question was, uh, because I mentioned that we had one open access journal that had 
had was on e-scholarship but with an embargo. Um, I, I feel free to say that because it's it's obvious if you go there and look that there aren't the most most recent issues. That's Comitatus. Uh, a Journal of Medieval Studies. And uh, Comitatus was one of the very early adopters of e-scholarship. Um, so they developed their model of, of uh, uh, publication uh, at, at a very early moment. They've retained that because they say that they have certain uh, agreements in place with uh, entities like EBSCO and, and I, I'm saying EBSCO, I don't know that they have real agreement with EBSCO, but that they have agreements in place that would prevent them from making their material available sooner. So it's usually put up, I think, two years later. It's a long time. But it is up there yeah. eventually. Yeah. Can I respond to that quite the previous question about um, disciplines? Um, I think, at least from my perspective as a librarian, I think um, we end up have we end up helping social science and humanities folks more than sciences because in a lot of ways I think that um, in the broader world the sciences are much further along with open access so the folks that are kind of coming to the library and are trying to find support for um, new and innovative ways to publish are, are often more from the, the social sciences and the humanities. Let me just add that embargoes are very common in profit and in for-profit uh, kinds of journals, and also, and they're one of the ways the intellectual property is managed on data. So, principal investigators often have an embargo of anywhere from six months to five years, depending on the agency and kind of funding, where they have exclusive control over their data before they're released for other people to use. So you see that. And then if you also think about things like um, uh, Project Muse and JSTOR, you see these moving walls where the it's available print only in the more recent and online for the older versions. Okay. So that the, the embargoes are all over the place with different, uh, different effects. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Ellen, please. I think I'll let others tackle. The question is about deposit of data in ways that other people can use it. Um, let me let others answer that and I'll come back to whatever is missing. Okay. I can respond quickly to that. Um, um, I wish I had my slide. One of the layers that we've talked about for the Encyclopedia of Egyptology, Vilika Vendrick is an um, archaeologist. and. Uh, we envisioned a data access layer, and that has started already with another um, NEH-funded project that she has. It's going to tap into the time map that we designed for the Encyclopedia of Egyptology. And what they're going to do is publish data sets that relate to maps that um, are useful to scholars who are uh, writing about a particular site or, or feature um, in Egypt, and they'll then be able to access high-quality maps that um, are highly researched, um, very, data, very data intensive, and they'll be sort of searchable through that time map interface. So yes, you know, we, we, we're really excited about that and um, got some uh, seed money to start on, on building that. The, the maps are now available for free, are downloadable as PDFs, and we'll make the AutoCAD files available through the digital library again and, and through uh, a website where people can access them. So there we see uh, a way that the journal, the encyclopedia, is also um, creating other venues for, for publication of data sets. Um, again, on the data, it's something you will see quite a bit of difference across disciplines, but there's some very interesting things going on in the humanities. If you look at the Perseus Project, which is arguably the oldest digital library online, and the kinds of things they've got, not only with classical Greek and Roman, but now they've got the, the City of London, these absolutely amazing time sliders, so the way you, you can move through time and visualize data in, in different kinds of ways. Greg Crane, who runs that, also has uh, written some very thoughtful pieces. One of my favorites is one in D-Lib magazine called What Do You Do With a Million Books? 
and really saying, what can you do when you unpack them? Well, now we can not only visualize them, we can start doing automatic translations and comparisons and mining in, in new ways, where in, in the scientific world, we've got lots of archiving of, say, astronomical data, where you can do new kinds of knowledge discovery through comparisons, move across different wavelengths. People will contribute their data in return for getting access to other data. And it, it's more mature in the sciences, also in moving in tighter interconnections. Uh, Phil Bourne just got the, at uh, San Diego just got the Jim Gray Award as one of the founders of Public Library of Science and the founding editor of the Public Library of Science uh, comp Computational uh, Biology. And he wrote a wonderful piece about five years ago on uh, how a journal is or is not like a database, how you re completely rethink what the journal is just like you can completely re rethink what a textbook is when it starts to become online, dynamic, interactive, when the data are part of the publication as well. Joanna. I just wanted to follow up yeah. on that and make a comment. I don't think I can repeat that either. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're probably close enough we picked it up. But, it, but absolutely, we've got all these rich social media environments, which, which themselves are openly available to be mined and used, not only... And, and, and contributed to, but and that was my opening point about the mix-up, the mash-up, the interoperability, that it's, you, you need to think not just about this journal, this data set alone, it's what you can do with it in combination. That's, that's what's so powerful, and I think was one of the most important takeaway points. Um, and Andrew's going to speak to the political action parts of it. Right? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. I, mean, I just thought you might have something like uh, I don't have anything at the moment. Um. I'll speak to you the um, what what we're trying to do in response to collecting and preserving some of that interesting content and um, uh, we are working uh, the California Digital Library with the UCs are working on um, services like um, web archiving service where the um, uh, the librarians or departments that want to capture either one site or several sites on a certain collection or topic um, can point a crawler to a lot of these different sites um, and do captures either once a year, once ever, once a week. However, depending on um, the the content that's that's appearing on the site and um, you know just kind of capturing some of that web stuff. So that's just one way that that. Um, you know, we're trying to, to think about the sort of scholarly communication that's happening outside of more traditional ways. Uh, so, I mean, I mean that, that's a very large and profound question about the tensions at play in the, the rich multimedia environments, uh, the need to maintain a scholarly record in ways that you can point to it and have some insurance of curation going forward. And that's a question that's by no means confined to open access. So let's see who would like to tackle that. I guess I can take a stab. I got um, one of the things that I thought about when we talked about um, uh, certain disciplines being more traditional than others is that we discovered that Egyptologists are very traditional <laughs> and they the most important thing to them was to have peer review, high quality PDFs. They were not interested at all in fancy time map interfaces, other ways of accessing the scholarship and, and you know, really, you know, it was that, that PDF file that was going to matter. Um, I think the thing that won them over a little bit was actually um, the the speed at which we could give them access to things that that had been peer reviewed. They were immediately posted on on CDL, and I and I think that started to change their minds about what online what online could be. They didn't have to wait 12 years to get an encyclopedia <laughs> article, you know, published and in in the hands of their students, you know. And I think in that sense. Um, a project like UEE has really transformed scholarship in, in changing the minds of very traditional scholars as to what online publication can mean. It's not just sending your students to Wikipedia and, and worrying about, you know, there's no one doing fact checking. You know. And I think we've, 
we've really turned the corner and, and changed some of their minds about some of the more innovative tools that we can put in their hands and, and how to make use of them. But I think it's been a very gradual education and we've had to introduce the the PDF version first in order to get that buy-in and keep them coming back. Does that make sense? Anyone else? I could just make one small comment. Um, the difference between our journals that are housed on e-scholarship and that operate independently is the degree of freedom they have to explore these other alternatives that uh, can be more dangerous uh, from a perspective of, of, of scholarly continuity of, of integrity of, of the of the document and of permissions uh, and, and using different kinds of widgets and things like that e-scholarship is limited in terms of what it will allow you to do in terms of multimedia but you're not going to get into too much trouble by trying to embed a program in it or by trying to uh, embed uh, different kinds of media whereas some of our other journals they're much more concerned they're, they understand the responsibility that when they're hosted elsewhere and they can do their own thing they are responsible for what they do and so they tend to visit our librarians perhaps more than our, our e-scholarship journals do so there's two different models of approaching being online and being adventuresome. Peter Murray Rust, right. yes. <laughs> um, that's. A, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and we could do a whole we could all do a whole day on the data part. Uh, Peter's been talking about those issues oh since the early I'd say six or eight years uh, by now, and he's a chemist at at Cambridge University. And he began to realize that as we moved to electronic publishing, uh, we were thinking uh, too much in terms of, of exactly that PDF, of freezing things into this highly structured form that simply emulates it. Clifford Lynch said the electronic journal is nauseatingly similar to the, uh, the print journal. And what the publishers were doing with chemical structures, and of course chemical structures are, are very rich models Plus, they've been standardized with with a they've been codified over about a hundred years, where there's a very clear way to to represent them. What the publishers were doing is taking this rich structured data, flattening it out into PDFs, where all you had was a bitmap, and you completely lost the data. And so his notion then is open data, is getting access to the data in the structured form so that it's retrievable and computable. And he's been writing robots to go out all over the internet and find what, it, he's a crystallographer, to find whatever molecule it is he wants, and then he pulls them all in. But he's now been working in the last few years with Microsoft, which has uh, worked with him to build a plug-in to, uh, to Word and PowerPoint in the Office Suite, where you can mark up your data within Word as you create it. You can mark up your publication and mark it up in the open data format natively. They're also building um, object reuse and exchange, the technology that we're using with SENS to do the overlay right into chemistry. So ORE Chem is the project. He's part of it. Uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Frey at Southampton, uh, Carl Lugosi at Cornell, and several others are, are really making great progress in open data. And again, here we've got Microsoft that's learned we need to play well with others. And they are trying to jump start some of the open access and open platforms by helping people do plug-in tools, which then makes their suites more attractive because you can publish directly from them and get the metadata and you and you can embed the Creative Commons licenses right into them as well. So, um. Well, I wish we had Libby here because we've been we've been talking with Libby about this issue quite a bit and um, I guess the only thing that I can contribute is that data and I think Bonnie you mentioned this too that data has its own sets of intellectual property rights and all these other issues that that need to be tackled and the thing Lisa Snyder's in the back here we just conducted a or Lisa masterminded a uh, data asset inventory of, of all of North Campus and one of the things that came out of that was recognizing that uh, no one person owned these data sets. Figuring out who actually owns them so that you can make them available 
in something other than just a table and a, and a PDF version is, is a complex process. And it, and it takes, you know, the cost of maintaining a data set that you intend to make available openly means that you need to track those rights very carefully. Who's funding the research? Who's entering the data? Who's doing all these things? <coughs> nice ideal. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just say I think this is just going to be a growing area because I know a lot of, uh, you mentioned funders, uh, grant funders, a lot of them are sort of on the verge of about to making, uh, uh, providing the data of the, of the research that they grant, um, making that also a mandatory part of the submission. So I think this will be an even bigger issue soon. It's striking that no one has mentioned the P word of provenance, mm -hmm. which is another part that's, that's key to this process. And it's something that people in information studies in, in archives and in libraries understand very well, and the computer science community is, is coming around to, that the ability to track provenance, to be able to to, to disaggregate the data and take it back to where it came from. So as you mix it up and mash it up, uh, can you see where it came from, both to do error correction, but to give credit where it's due. And people are more willing to contribute their data, the kinds of things that you were asking about. I mean, it's partly some of the things you were asking about, if they can track it forward. So that, that's a big research front right now on the provenance issues. And it's one that uh, Laura Weinholds is getting the be for inaugural best student paper for the digital curation conference for tackling the question of identity and what is you link to and Heather has been working with Lisa on the data inventory so we've got lots of people in this room who've been uh, wrestling with some very challenging and intellectually exciting questions here okay well I think this was um, fabulous we've uh, not done nearly enough joint sessions with the library. This uh, wonderful turnout, I think, also exhibits um, how popular this topic is and how important it is. We need to thank our um, four superlative speakers today. So.